All right, it's a kind of long list, so let's go ahead and get started. First off, you know, because I have two weeks worth of stuff to watch, uh, first on the list is Coisant, which was very interesting, entertaining, and strange. I don't know how else to put it. Five numbers it turned out to be not as mysterious as I was hoping to be, but very interesting. And I think I saw a review before I watched it that said that it maybe didn't explain itself too well, and that's probably pretty accurate. Let's see. I watched Kaon and the Kaon Specials, or Special, the, that's the Live House Special, since the other thing that was a special is included in the series itself, I guess, and inserted somewhere in the middle, maybe. But yeah, it, it was very entertaining, as Kaon tends to be. Uh, let's see. I watched uh, Loops Equals Garrus, and that one, hmm, so about the strangest thing about that one is that it seems confused on the gender of one character. And I don't know if that was intentional or accidental. Because in the picture drama, it's pretty clear black and white. And I thought it was also pretty clear black and white in the um, trailer for the movie. But a very strange. As, as for... Yeah, it's kind of hard to talk about what all was exactly strange about that one without... Um, Spoiling it. I, I can say that as a longer movie, you know, I thought some of the characters were pretty interesting and some of the ideas, well, maybe not. But no, I, I'd say, I'd call some of the ideas kind of refreshing as well. It's just kind of hard to explain them beyond that without spoiling. So let's go on to the next. Um, I watched Chaos Head and I thought that was actually a pretty nice series. Granted, it would have been really spectacular if that feeling I felt near the beginning was kept consistent, but for me to explain that one, I'm going to have to compare um, very briefly to Paranoia Agents. So, um, one thing that I found really fascinating watching Paranoia Agent is I kind of felt like the anime was making me the viewer crazy as opposed to <clears throat> any character in the series per se. And the thing about Paranoia Agent that's alarming when it does this is it kind of makes it feel natural and comforting, I suppose, to go insane. Um, or at least that's kind of the interesting feeling I get from watching Paranoia Agent and why I think it's so, you know, great. Um, Chaos Head, um, in contrast, now they're trying to make, to establish one character as either really crazy or not crazy, but the thing that made Chaos Head so interesting for me at the beginning is it kind of had that similar feeling where that, that disorientation of whether we the viewer were also crazy, I kind of felt like we also didn't understand what was going on just as much as the character did. So we didn't necessarily have to empathize with the character to realize that he's seeing delusions and we're not sure if we're really seeing them or not ourselves. And the interesting contrast between Chaos Head and Paranoia Agent that way is that Chaos Head was just very sharp and jarring, a kind of paranoid crazy as opposed to Paranoia Agent's non-paranoid crazy, which is kind of funny if you think about the name, except Chaos is kind of more chaotic than... Uh, oh, well, anyways. <clears throat> so, my only real problem with Chaos Head is that it just started making too much sense eventually. And in that regard... So, it kind of lost its footing there, but otherwise, I thought it, it was just really neat to watch. Um, kind of hard to explain too much about it without making it make sense to anybody who hasn't seen it yet and may watch it, I guess. 
Oh well. Next series, I watched Star Driver Part 1, and that was actually very fascinating as well. Um, so, there's... So, Evangelion was considered a deconstruction of the mecha genre to kind of point out how absurd everything is, and it, it kind of brought on a couple decades of, um, no, about a decade of, um, more realistic sort of, um, mechas. Mechas that treat this material in, in a similar fashion, I suppose. Now, I'm not sure that Evangelion is necessarily the first one to do this, but it is the one that popularized the concept. <coughs> And blah blah blah, and I heard some people who were calling Gurren Lagann a reconstruction of the Mecha. That said, uh, I'm not. Sh I can sh I can agree with it. And Gurren Lagann was definitely not the first thing it did during the Evangelion age, where it was just so exciting and thrilling to watch. Because I remember Gal 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 being similar. But the basic idea is, if we consider Gurren Lagann a reconstruction of the old Mecha genre, where people are able to pull out whatever they need in order to win at, at the moment, then Star Driver seems to be kind of along those same lines where it's like, it's okay to do this now, and Star Driver just throws in a couple of other interesting twists to it. It almost seems a bit magical boyish, you know, you see a lot of magical girl and then people ask, are they magical boy, and they're like, how about this, this, this. Star Driver comes interestingly close with, tran with a brief transformation sequence that seems like something out of a magical girl, except he's transforming into an outfit that he's piloting a mecha with, I guess. Very strange, but also kind of neat and different. And at the same time, um, with the the way the anime is set up, it's kind of got this slightly overdramatic setup of the bad guys getting ready to attack that actually reminds me of Revolu Revolutionary Girl Utena. Specifically, I think of the second saga, although um, I don't remember what the build-up for battle is in the third saga. I really ought to finish it, and I can't remember what the first saga was like. So it's, it's more like the Black Rose Saga. I think that's what it was called. In that regard, it's just a very subtle thing. Beyond that, it's been interesting, it's been unexpected, it's been maybe not world blowing like something such as Green Logan, but I've been enjoying it at least through this first half of it. The second half comes out some other time. I don't actually keep track of release dates that well, just what's coming out really. Oh well, anyways, let's see. After that, I watched Bubblegum Crisis, an old anime from the 80s, I think. And I've seen Tokyo uh, Bubblegum Crisis Tokyo 2040, which um, made Bubblegum Crisis, the original, seem kind of confusing because I had a feeling of deja vu watching bits and pieces of it, and I think it's those are bits and pieces where Tokyo 2040 was building upon the ideas in Bubblegum Crisis. Now, if I were to compare to the, compare the two, uh, it's pretty clear that Bubblegum Crisis sets up a neat thing, but its main drawback is that it just doesn't feel like there's an overall purpose to watching all of it. it I, I, kind of, I was kind of hoping there would be some sort of build-up, and that's just probably coming from having watched Tokyo 2040. So, it, it almost really was episode per episode, almost. I mean, it kind of built up the universe, but didn't really have much point to it. So in that regard, I probably went in expecting a little more from it than I, than it was trying to do. And in that regard, that disappointment's probably understandable and more my fault. And it was otherwise a pretty enjoyable show. Bubblegum Crash was more interesting. Although right now I'm trying to remember what happened in it. I just remember that it was a sub, it was a smaller selection of episodes with a purpose. And I just don't remember what that purpose was. So 
because a lot of this stuff started happening as the move was beginning to rear its ugly head. Oh, I can't remember. So, I did. I was going to go on to AD Police, but one of the files on the or one of the DVDs on my server was corrupted, and I couldn't um, replace it until I moved and unpacked. And well, I can get to AD Police stuff now and fix that. Um, I've got DVDs to continue unpacking, and I've actually been doing other stuff. So, I've, I've, the series I finished up before the move was Angel Links. Uh, something I've been meaning to watch. Um, I, I had watched about half of it. Actually, it turns out I had watched about three quarters of it and only had one DVD left in actuality. So my estimate of seven episodes was wrong. It was actually ten episodes into it. But that doesn't matter. I rewatched it all from the beginning and it was an okay series. It lacks a lot compared to Outlaw Star. And for those of you who don't know why I'm comparing it to Outlaw Star, that's because it takes place in the same universe. Uh, there's an episode of Outlaw Star where the crew of the Outlaw Star are being held in a mil military facility, and the people running that facility um, are a lizard man and a girl with two colored hair, I think red there. Oh, well, anyways, the, they're, they're members of the crew in the Angel Inks anime, and I. I guess I'm not quite sure if that's taking place before or after. Uh, or if maybe it's just kind of in the same universe, but rebooted or something. I, I, I don't know. All I know is I watched it and I couldn't help but think that it was lacking a certain something compared to Outlaw Star, but on its own, it, it had some really neat things. For example, I really found that a giant space creature that's almost like a space version of a whale to be very fascinating. And another curiosity is I'm pretty sure in Outlaw Star they call the material that makes star travel possible or rather rapid star travel possible Dragonite. And I don't remember what they referred to the species as the Lizard Man but in the Angel Inks dub the Dragonites are the lizard people, and they call the stone that makes travel possible something else. Was it Dragon Ore? It was very brief, and I don't remember anymore. Again, I've been in the middle of a move. Oh, well. I can't remember, so that was an interesting thing. and I, I, I haven't looked too much into the details on why that is, but it's still fascinating. <sighs> Let's see. I also... Um, while here, um, working on stuff, um, during one of my, I don't want to focus too much on moving stuff, I want to watch a good anime, I watched, um, this, this is part two of Squid Girl, and just as entertaining, Squid Girl is a very fun series, and I, I it's kind of hard to think why exactly that is. And it kind of ended at a, kind of an appropriate way for a series that doesn't really have much of an overall story. It's not unexpected the way it went, but that is what it is. And, um, Media Blasters was kind enough to include the, uh, two Squid Girl specials. Little four-minute, simple little things with, um, characters just doing random stuff. It's really nice when they, you know, an anime distribution company is able to be thorough like that. It's something that really appreciable and Squid Girl I think is definitely worth um, getting because you know it's a very complete thing. Alright and then um, <clears throat> the final thing I did and I've watched this all throughout doing all of this stuff I finished um, Pokemon Advance. In other words I watched all the way up to the end of season 9 and then I hunted down AG120 the Japanese episode 397, I think, which is called um, Ash and May Heated Battles of Hoenn, or Satoshi and Haruka Heated Battles of Hoenn, something like that. There, you can go a lot of different ways with the translation, but the basic idea is that it took place sometime in or around the end, sometime near or around the end of season 8. No, okay, I just think it took place somewhere in season 8. And it's, um, 
just a clip show. It, it just uh, summarizes stuff that had happened up to there, and this is the first one Pokemon did. There's two more in the Diamond and Pearl stuff, and for understandable reasons, um, I'm not sure if 4Kids has been doing all these dubs. I may have read somewhere that they no longer did the dub for some stuff, and I might have heard voices change that suggest that did happen. I, mean, I haven't been paying too close attention, because <clears throat> you don't have to pay too close attention to Pokemon to keep up with what's going on until the important episodes come around. But anyways, you know, I downloaded and watched that one episode, so that I would have a complete watching experience of um, Pokemon Advance. And, um, what can I say? So overall, um, definitely not as nostalgic as the first Pokemon series, which of course would be because I've watched the first Pokemon series, or at least the first couple seasons of the first one, but never this one. But one thing about it that was definitely nice, <clears throat> which I didn't really think about until <clears throat> the end of the ninth season there, was um, I realized that Ash's female companion isn't wasn't just like a trophy companion of some sort. I mean, what did Misty do other than be a part of the group and complain about everything and then at one point just be the gym leader that he had to fight? Whereas May is also on her own adventure along with Ash. And I realized that's actually kind of nice. And... May and Max's douchiness did, um, <clears throat> it didn't seem nearly so obvious by the end. There were a couple of small parts here and there that reminded me of some of the old, uh, eye roll parts from the original Pokemon, mostly along the lines of, so you're going to pull a gun on them because they're trespassing, never mind the fact that you didn't even mark your property and put no trespassing signs up and people are just supposed to read your mind and <clears throat> blah 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 blah. Well, uh, nothing quite that bad happened, but you got kind of close with a Voltorbs in this one ranch. Anyways, um, it was really neat watching once again, if, if it's something really big and major Ash can only win it if it's not something that would make everybody have to instantly respect him. But at the same time, no, I say that, but, you know, I, I guess I'm trying to do this without spoiling it. And I may have already said too much, but it's, I guess one thing that makes it interesting to watch is you pretty, you usually have a pretty good idea who's going to win and how. You can sometimes guess when, oh, it's been a while since Ash um, lost at a gym, so he's going to lose at this gym and have to try it again after learning a valuable lesson, and you kind of predict it's going to build up to that here and there, sort of, and you, you can guess, okay, there's no way he's going to actually win this contest, and there's no way she's going to win this contest, because then they become too important. And season nine ends with Ash becoming pretty close to becoming important. To the point where Nurse Joy, who's um, a big fan of big battlers, knows Ash. And, uh, of course, May, and because she's also into contests. And Harley, who was a real fucking asshole. But he was designed to be that way. Uh, but it, it ends with Ash, you know, kind of taking a step out to another place where people maybe never heard of him. And I didn't go into uh, Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, but stopping at the end of AG and remembering that the reason I wanted to push myself through all this stuff is because I'm still curious what modern Pokemon is like. Uh, it's too bad Best Wishes is not on DVD, because that's the one I'm most curious about right now. So I, I have to get through Diamond and Pearl, which I see is as long as um, Advanced. So I've got, I've got my work cut out for me, but... For now, I can watch other stuff while I finish unpacking DVDs, and so that's probably what this week is going to start out with.